Good morning, RailsConf 2014. How are you guys doing? Do a big clap for yourselves. I haven't done anything yet, but clap for you. More louder, more louder, more louder. Yeah! Oh, uh, oh, uh, noise! Uh, while I was watching these all-stars get their awards, I actually, I was responsible for 330 gems in that moment. I'm so good <laughs> at Ruby right now. Take that, Node.js, what? Uh, I was very, very excited uh, about Katrina's victory. I was sitting two seats next to her and just felt like maybe I had something to do with it. I didn't. <laughs> but it's nice to feel certain things, even if you're not responsible. I want to start in the beginning for me as far back as I'm able to go with documentation so far. This is a photo of my mother's grandfather, my great Grandfather Benjamin Lonesome, born just as slavery was wrapping up in the U.S., born in Carolyn County, Virginia, and uh, taught himself to read, moved to Washington, D.C., helped build roads and design uh, the highway system there, the road system there, and he had several kids, one of whom was my mother's mother. Um, her name was Lorraine Martin. She was very proud woman, very accomplished, especially considering the timing of her own life. She was, I found out much later in my life, and at the end of my mother's own life, the first black employee at the U.S. Supreme Court building. Now, this is something my mother never told me and my older sister. It's a weird family secret to keep. <laughs> right? Family secrets are supposed to be embarrassing. It's like so-and-so had a leg longer than the other, so-and-so voted for... You know, he who should not be named. Um, but you don't, like, shh, quietly, Grandma was a civil rights hero. Don't tell people. They might respect us. Like, <laughs> what's the downside? I, don't, I can't understand exactly. But they had a very, very fractured relationship, so fractured that my sister and I found out about this historic fact by going through my mother's possessions after she died. And we found this clip. Like, why is Grandma hanging out with Jimmy Carter? Is there another story we don't know? What's going on here? Um, so yeah, my, my grandmother and I didn't have much of a relationship. I heard stories. I remember she smelled like, what was it? Orange juice, cigarette smoke, vodka. That was a nice, strong memory for like a five-year-old little boy. And she was so busy with her own life. She traveled. She had this job. She was active in her church. She wasn't always uh, super excited about uh, the duties of being a mom herself with, with her own daughter. And I'm not sure how she could do that, because this is my mother at age four. Super, super adorable. Like, who wouldn't want to be around that? Look at the cheeks. You can see where I get my cuteness from. It's pretty obvious. So she ships my mother off at age eight. The year is 1948 to a rural boarding school in Pennsylvania, a Catholic boarding school. And my mother didn't like it. And I know she didn't like it because she wrote a letter saying she didn't like it. For those who can't see this, or maybe in general, I will share the text. Dear Mother, I am having fun, but I do not like it here. <laughs> so that was like a hint that she didn't like it. I am mad at you. Please send me some cookies and a Sparkle Plenty doll. They can have dolls here. Please send it, because I do not have anything to play with. Yours truly, Arnita. <laughs> That's a sad state of affairs. Uh, it's also a sad state of handwriting. I'm hating on my mom's handwriting, but it's pretty, the lines are all over the place. Uh, she can work on the formation. But in the lower left corner, you see some very, very clear, easy to read handwriting. It just says, over. And when you turn this letter over, you find another letter which says, if your little girl is dissatisfied, we'd be glad to have her bed for children who are anxious to come. Signed, sister. <laughs> and I think when she wrote it, she like barely moved a muscle. Like, just sister. This was um, an early prototype of the NSA prison program. They were testing it out <laughs> on would-be terrorists, also known as little black girls who want cookies, because they may also want to vote eventually, and we got to nip those rights in the bud before they get out of hand. 
My mom didn't last long in the school. She came back. She finished up in DC. Uh, she was a features editor at her high school newspaper. She's here dressed very appropriately for the era with a dress cut below the knees and a basket presumably filled with positive, affirmative thoughts about the state of democracy in America. I am sure of it. <laughs> it's a happy time. It's the 50s. Everything was great. And uh, things shifted for her a little bit. I would say her social network shifted. She started hanging out with a different type of crowd, a crowd that looked more like this. This was a good friend of my mom's at the time. His name was El Dorado. I don't know very much detail except that his name was El Dorado. <laughs> I don't need any more detail except that his name was El Dorado. And you, you look at all the cool hunting and trendsetting and millennial obsession and what's going to happen and who's going to buy what and what's hip, hot, cool, zip, zap, bop. None of it matters. The last cool human to walk the earth was El Dorado. <laughs> Look at him again. <laughs> let it sink in and let your own lack of cool just be out there. I feel it too. Uh, every time I show this slide, I feel less awesome. So then my mom's out in the streets. She's challenging authority in some way, uh, metaphorically, in the streets outside of her mom's own office. This is Walking down 16th Street, Northwest Washington, D.C., where I would later grow up, Malcolm X Park in the background. Yay for me growing up. Thank you so much for cheering <laughs> the hormonal process. Um, and I'm, my mom is right there in the middle, uh, eyes focused, not on the prize, but on the camera, because you never know, you might end up in a keynote presentation in the future. <laughs> Selfies before was hot. All right. When you have uh, a mother like this, you don't get normal reading materials as a kid. Uh, this is the first book I remember having as a small child. <laughs> I was eight years old. And it, it looked that bad. It was like, is that blood? What is going on? <laughs> like, I'm just mad at people all of a sudden, all the time now. I'm protesting Cocoa Puffs because it's got to be racist somehow. I don't know the arguments yet. I'm not strong enough intellectually to make the argument, but I'm mad. Thanks, Mom. Uh, this is the shot outside of our apartment, looking very wire-like, with this is a, sort of a local economic uh, grassroots activity that you're seeing here, a hand-to-hand -hand commerce, sort of an artisanal, sort of locally grown kind of thing going on here, uh, really native local markets. Um, <laughs> and my mom just took these pictures. I still don't, she never fully explained why she would just take pictures of drug deals going down. She wasn't an informant. She didn't like the cops either, but I think she just, was anticipating like the 20 year drug dealer reunion and she could sell these back, you know, like when you're on a roller coaster and it's like, remember when this happened? Uh, this is middle school graduation for me. That's my older sister back to back. Her name is Belinda. She lives in Lansing, Michigan. And uh, she was, all right, for living. That's good. You guys are applauding strange, strange verbs. Um, she was a journalist for 20 something years and uh, worked at the Dallas Morning News, worked for Gannett Newspapers, worked at the Lansing State Journal, where she was the digital news director uh, and assistant managing editor at the same time as I was director of digital at The Onion. So we basically had the same job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> except, uh, sadly, uh, I remember having arguments with her, not arguments, just observations from her, because we had launched our uh, iPhone app, and our web traffic was such and such and such, and she was like, but I do the real news. <laughs> uh, I was winning. Lies were winning, basically. Uh, that's my mom, obviously, uh, in the center, and that's me, uh, with a little flare of rebellion with my kente cloth in the form of a tie. <laughs> Corporate rebellion. I loved it. Um, so here's how this family worked. My mother was the one to raise us and to finance that, that raising. She had a job as a systems analyst for the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. She was a computer programmer. She started doing this in the late 1970s. She did not have a formal college education, not a complete one. I, in fact, remember sitting in community college classes with her as she was trying to bolster her IT and tech skills. So she went from domestic worker, dinner cooker, paralegal, assistant to 
GS something in the government ranking system, which is able to afford me going to the school that I was graduating from here now, Sidwell Friends School, my sister going off to be a journalist, um, all because of computer programming. She is the original black girl's code. That's my mom, um, without any actual nonprofit behind it. <laughs> and that had a, another big influence. I obviously had the apartheid thing in my brain uh, from an early age, that so the hacking into my awareness. But we also had computers constantly uh, as a young kid with the first family on the block with a computer. I was playing Dr. J and Larry Bird, going on the internet super early, thanks to my school in like 1993. And um, this is uh, a, a great shot. My sister captured it. This is me graduating from Harvard University, 1999. Uh, and my mom embraced me. And she said, we did it! <laughs> I was like, what do you, what do you mean, wait? <laughs> Moms, <laughs> I took the test. Um, <laughs> but it was a metaphorical and in some real practical ways, we, because of the generations that took to create this moment, because of the mentors I had, because of the studies, because of the investment, financial, uh, moral, and caloric that had been made uh, in me to get to this point. Now, when I showed up on campus, I was convinced I was going to be a computer science major. Uh, I had been super internet kid. I was always a kid fixing my friends' computers. And, and I took the intro to computer science class in the fall of 1995, which meant C. And uh, I did not end up majoring in computer science because I discovered the power of the semicolon uh, to ruin everything. <laughs> everything. Like if you misplace a semicolon in, a, in an essay, people still get what you mean. Right? They may get judgmental about it. I should have been an M dash, but they don't, you know, they don't act like you said nothing. <laughs> I'm like 15 pages in, I've said nothing. What about all my loops? This shit is nothing. So I was like, yeah, okay, programming. I'm going to take a little break from you. And I, I, uh, I majored in philosophy, which was actually not that far, a different sort of anal retentiveness uh, <laughs> in terms of the analytic world and logic and, and everything. So I couldn't fully escaped that, and I was one of the first online editors at the Harvard Crimson, our newspaper, and paid for school with a job testing software. So I've tried to stay close to this world, uh, even as I've drifted you know, from the hardcore flavors of this world. But a lot of it comes down to, to this woman who helped make that possible. Now, my sister, she ended up on a different and even more beautiful path, I think. She um, started teaching yoga. She got really excited about it, got really into it, and she was bugged by the notion of yoga as just the province of super thin and lithe and Lululemon and $60 pants. And um, she started teaching it for free uh, for a donation-based price in the hood in Lansing. And she eventually left the newspaper altogether to be full-time teaching donation-based yoga in the hood <laughs> in Lansing, which is just the worst endorsement for the newspaper industry, I think. <laughs> this is a veteran, award-winning person who's like, I want to teach free yoga <laughs> to people with no money. I think there's a bigger future in it. <laughs> so this is my obligatory family shout out. This is my sister's Twitter account. She's great. You're in the Midwest here. You can make your way up to Lansing and support some of the work that she is doing. So what happens after this foundation is laid uh, of this great older sibling, of this mother, of this infusion of politics and technology and doing all these newsy type things? Well, I obviously ended up here at America's Finest News Source and uh, worked for The Onion for five years. And it was a great way I got that job. They posted um, a job for politics editor in the fall of 2007. I just moved to New York from Boston. And I was like, that's my job. They don't know it yet, but they'll come around. And applied for that job and got through part of the interview process. And they said, what, what would you like to be the web editor as well? And like, oversee everything we're doing online. And I'm like, yeah, like, so that's like another job, right? Like, no, no, same job. Uh, so you're going to, is there like more pay? No, no, same pay. Um, <laughs> the onion negotiation style was very aggressive. And of course I said yes, because it was the greatest job I ever had. 
um, and got to play around and, and have a lot of fun there. I also wrote a book toward the tail end of my tenure there, um, a very humble uh, identity guide, and a, with a very subtle marketing message that I, wish, I wouldn't want to push people <laughs> too much. Some people used to be so heavy-handed with the bye, bye, bye. It's like, no, no, no. It's, let people come to this on their own terms. <laughs> Face the consequences. So what's been fun about this, uh, the book is a memoir. You know, it covers some of the ground I just did, but in a lot more words, so you don't even have to read those chapters. It's also got uh, this guide to, sort of a, this how-to satirical guide, how to be the black friend, uh, how to speak for all black people, how to be the black employee, how to be the next black president. Um, and then there are a series of interviews that I conducted with a panel of experts. I called them my black panel. And what made them expert is that they were born black. And so they had decades of experience in the game. And so I wanted to kind of test that out. And I balanced the scales as evenly as I could. I had three black men. I had three black women. And as a control group, I had one white Canadian man. <laughs> and I asked them very essential questions. When did you first realize you were black? Which is like an interesting question, like when do you first realize you're anything? You know, there's somebody from the outside usually says something weird about you. Um, how black are you? Preferably quantify it. Um, did you ever wish you weren't black? And can you swim? Uh, <laughs> very grounded, very scientific questions. And the best part about uh, my, my uh, control group uh, answer, so I didn't want just any white guy. I wanted the whitest white guy I could find. And so I was like, I had to go north, colder, right, Canada. And I also wanted someone who was a real authority, so I got Christian Lander, who wrote stuff white people like and was behind that whole blog. So like, he has put himself out there speaking for white people's interests. And he did a great job. For those of you who are white, I can, there's a couple of you. Um, <laughs> you have a great ambassador in Christian Lander. You should send him some kind of, like, re-up or vote for him again. I don't know how it works in your councils. I just, I watch Game of Thrones. I feel like it's messy, but... He should thumbs up in the arena for him. Let him fight another fight. Uh, so that was fun. The other fun thing has been seeing people start to play with the, the meme of the book. And uh, something that I didn't necessarily drive, but have witnessed and, and enjoyed is Instagram around how to be black. And you start to see this blend of pure old school editorial with flatter networked world where everybody can publish. And so pictures start to emerge on this theme. <laughs> Now, every picture's got a story of at least a 1,000 words, preferably less if you have a good editor. In this case, the man holding the book prior to this photo was white. Uh, still is. I, I did the book. The book's not that good. It's not, I mean, it's disclaimer, <laughs> spoiler alert. You're going to stay whatever you are. Um, but he walked into the subway and was uh, somehow coincidentally surrounded by this group of black men who were curious about the object in his hand. Um, and so they said, what good sir are you reading? Uh, which is just is how older black men talk now. I don't know how many of you are in touch, but it was decided last week. And, uh, and their faces capture the full range of reaction that I've seen on the internet to the book. You got dopey smurf on the left, doesn't get it. Checked out, not for him. That's okay. That's okay. Not everything is for everybody. Moving right along. Super engaged reader. Probably going to miss a train because he's so into it. Healthy skeptic, engaged skeptic. He's going to take to like Reddit or like some Twitter hashtag hatred later. But right now he's building up his arguments. And then you got the brother on the right. He's a special case because he's offended. Because he doesn't need some stupid book to tell him how to be black. Obviously, look at his matching turtleneck, <laughs> leather jacket, baseball cap. He's got blackness on lockdown. Um, and then you see people really playing around, a lot more fun. Some of these from Tumblr, some from Reddit. I mean, every six to seven weeks, it actually front pages on Reddit because Reddit's like a, like a clownfish. It just forgets itself constantly. So people like, look what I found. I was like, no, idiot, we found this 13 times already. But it's fun to watch people have the same argument over and over again. Uh, the wisdom of crowds, I believe, is what they call that. Um, and then, you know, people staging really interesting <laughs> moments. <laughs> 
And the book has been assigned in school, so uh, the compulsory mark is the best one. I encourage you all to, to get into that. Um, if credits are on the line, then you have a growth market. It's nice. So since then, uh, I've tried to think about how and where to bring these threads together, bring the storytelling, bring the humor, bring the, the creativity, broadly speaking, into a home bigger than just my body, because I'm a finite being with limited capacity. I'm going to die at some point. And uh, companies, they live forever. Uh, and they have better tax uh, benefits. So I started one. It's better to be a company in this country. If you haven't figured that out, uh, there should be a session on that. Um, so I started this company called Cultivated Wit um, as I, I left The Onion. And it's based on this quote from Horace. A cultivated wit, one that badgers less, can persuade all the more. Artful ridicule can address contentious issues more competently and vigorously than can severity alone. Um, and so that is our sort of marching order to try to bring these threads together. It also means that we uh, have a really cool website. And I'm going to risk everything and take you to a live web demo thing. Keyboard. So here's what we're uh, up to. First of all, a little winky. That's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. <laughs> Right, trying to build some personality into some basic things. So this is, you know, we're a company that does these and that. So we are operating on sort of four bands, uh, at least. One of which is doing marketing and digital storytelling and sort of making campaigns that are beautiful with design. We merged with an animation and design studio out of San Francisco. Um, and so work on behalf of good clients to tell good stories. We do an event series called Comedy Hack Day that I'm going to tell you more about in detail later. But it's the best comedy show you've ever seen, and certainly the best hackathon. Uh, building tools, we have a little tiny software department of one, uh, of a developer, we feed him, uh, Red Bull, and <laughs> two hours of sunlight per week, and uh, he's doing great. He's doing really, really great. He's a co-founder. Uh, and then we do these things, we do speaking uh, and workshops. We also have uh, some fun things on the blog, whatever, whatever. Uh, best emails ever. I wanted to take you through one of the interactions uh, on our site. So we created this thing called Section 4. And it's like, do you care to enter? Well, yeah, I want to I wanna enter Section 4. Um, there's no one seeing. OK, cool, great. The thing you're clicking is pretty quickly. We worry you're not taking this seriously. One more time, are you sure? Yep, I am sure. Join the society. What is your name? OK, great. Got that down. You just give your name to strange websites. You're not doing much of the way. What would you like to be called? Grand Puba. OK, good. In case of emergency, what email address can we reach you in order to ask for a phone number? <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's do that. Uh, how would you rate your experience so far? This is, I would say, a four. Next question. What is your superpower? You have to be bringing something to the table if we're going to be let you in at the very least. I would say it's growing on patience. Uh, let's get you into section four. How would you rate your experience so far? And sliding. Uh, last thing before you enter, did it bother you having to jump through so many <laughs> hoops? It actually did. Uh, how? Well, guess what? You're not in, not until you correctly answer these questions, which is better. Bass guitar or writing elk? So round of applause for writing elks. <laughs> round of applause for bass guitar. <laughs> All right, bass guitar. Uh, how many miles in a marathon? <laughs> I'm just going to go with Jetpack. I'm not going to sample the crowd on that one. Who is the smartest person alive? Uh, Stephen Cocky, <laughs> Hitler, OK. Uh, other, let's say Katrina Owens. Yeah. All right. Oh, right, I should probably like, enter that. Uh, name any former US president if he had been born in an alternate universe where all humans were named after plant life. The fuck? OK. Very good. How was your, your experience so far? Uh, that's actually, are you currently, have you ever been a member of any of the following? Al Qaeda, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, the American Dental Association, any Seagull Conservation Society, or has your really any pro Seagull organization of any kind, or the Oakland PD? Have you ever been involved in production of sale of little miniature cars that Shriners drive during parades? No. What is the secret password? Great. I just typed in the word secret to see what happened. Please pick any contentious issue of the day. Take a side. State in 100 words or less. Why? Uh, no thanks. Uh, how would you rate your experience so far? Oh, look. They're fucking <laughs> all five. Just like 
elections. <laughs> the results are rigged. OK, send my application. Uh, your application for admission to Section 4 has been received. Uh, thousands of people have uh, gone through this process, and we are still reviewing those applications. Uh, we'll get back to them slash me at some point after now. Uh, and then we have this Whiskey Friday uh, community, which is about bringing people together in a very complex celebration. Uh, at the end of the week, uh, on a Friday, you drink whiskey. That's it. That's it. That's it. So um, I wanted to, I'm going to actually, oh, we had plenty of good time. So here's what happened with, uh, part of what happened with us is we were some heavy, like, word-based people, and we found the folks who built that website uh, with us, slash for us, were called I Shot Him, and they were a design and animation studio, won a lot of awards for really beautiful infographics and visual storytelling, and we were, meanwhile, coming out of this Onion background of, like, word-based storytelling. So we just decided to combine forces and create Voltron. Here is uh, what we released for our merger. The merger. Oh. 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 I shot him and cultivated wit are now one creative supergroup. That felt good. Like, really good. I need a moment. So that's uh, that. Oh, good. Yay, applause. And now let's risk the live demo again. So you guys remember when... Um, so we have this thing in the U.S. It's um, the Constitution, right? And in it, it sets forth a certain job, a member of Congress. And presumably attached to that job is doing it. Um, but in late October last year, Congress, one of the few designated constitutional jobs in the whole country, said, we're not going to do it anymore. And they shut it all down. And so people were upset. And the news was covering things. And we were like, how do we respond to this? So we went to, uh, you ever bought a domain name when you're drunk? Any round of applause, anybody? Ever? Yeah? <laughs> so we said, I wonder if uh, fuckyoucongress.com is available. And surprisingly, it was. Uh, and so we bought it and proceeded to retell the story of the government shutdown in a manner that was a bit more direct um, and in a way that people could better understand. And so we would find news stories that were talking about how this shutdown affected people, um, and then retell it in, in pithier language, in more tweetable language. Uh, so you're just kind of cycling through this thing, um, and it was really uh, effective uh, at generating and sort of capturing the, uh, the anger that was in people. And then we said, OK, let's go beyond just kind of click rage and actually put your zip code in and share your thoughts with your member of Congress, which for many people is the first time they knew who their member of Congress was. So that was a nice introduction. Um, and then the third level was to get beyond all that. 
uh, and to really get people registered through TurboVote to be connected to Root Strikers and Sunlight Foundation to actually engage in a more productive thing. So take this cathartic moment, uh, which is very political, take this profanity, this great word, which is fuck. It's just, it's just a great word. Thank you, thank you, five people. I feel like maybe there was a policy paper issued right before you attended which says do not celebrate the word fuck. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was a ton of fun. Now for things that have less to do with that. Oh yeah, and I left the internet for a little bit, but I'm not gonna talk about that because I'd rather get to uh, the actual meat, which is less about where I've been or where the groups I've been attached to have been and where I think we can all go in terms of bringing creativity and humor storytelling, broadly speaking, and technology and coding closer together. Because I've straddled that line myself, having overseen development teams, having been a terrible programmer. Bless you, by the way. Um, so here is my weird theory of uh, how these worlds can and should come together to be more interesting than they are apart. I've never shared this before. This is, you're getting the, the, the new, new theory uh, as articulated in this way. When you think about, and you can think of the word comedy as media, you can think of a story, vague creativity and big quotation marks. Code doesn't have to mean exactly software programming or engineering. It can mean technology, broadly speaking. But we've been in this world, this, this level one world, where you were kind of using each other as means. It's like, oh, I have a, a comedic video, and I'm going to cut and paste it over a transport method over the internet and call it like innovation. It's like, no, it's just like a slice of TV shipped differently. It's not, you're not changing the, very, the underlying nature of the type of humor that, that's happening there. So it's not necessarily innovation happening in that particular view of the world. And if you get a little closer, you kind of bring these things together, part of what happens is people putting jokes and humor in places not designed for them. There's a container, and folks will shove creativity into it with or without permission. Um, here is an example. Now you see a lot of this in performance art and UX insertion. So five years ago, um, we had the swine flu, huge news viral thing, much more than the actual H1N1 virus uh, spread. And I had a thought, which was, is there a Twitter account for the swine flu? The answer is yes, there were three. They were all distributing legitimate scientific information about the swine flu, which I thought was a missed opportunity. <laughs> so I created the underscore swine underscore flu uh, as a very extreme um, personality, a condescending, all-knowing, arrogant, and profane little creature uh, who would, do do do. There we go. Right. This is the swine flu. Angry little piglet. Bird flu ain't got shit on me. Uh, location fucking everywhere. And the most fun of this character lived out through a Twitter account, which is obviously not new now, but at the time was not done very much. Um, was playing with the mechanics of Twitter in the process, because there were a lot of auto notifications set up. If you got a new follower, Twitter would just email you and tell you. They didn't even give you the chance to opt out of that early on. So I would find people who were talking about the swine flu, especially those who were expressing a fear of contracting the swine flu. And I would follow those people. And then that would trigger an event. An email shows up in their box saying, you are now being followed by the swine flu. <laughs> That's a new type of joke that's happening, right? That's like time delayed delivery. It's like a Doppler effect on a punchline. Like, I don't even know what that's called, but it's not stand up, it's something else. Um, it's interesting, and, and it wasn't coding, but it was kind of taking advantage of the mechanics of the system. The Mayor Emanuel Twitter account, uh, obviously, out yeah, of this town, was a ton of fun, and sort of using the idea of character played out in a different medium, not on an SNL sketch, but through this feed that we're all taking part in and having that interruption of this character in the li same life that follows BBC News accounts and you know, your uh, other friends from the Twitterverse. So there's another example of this that I did not orchestrate at all, merely witnessed. The Onion ran this story many years back, Planned Parenthood opens $8 billion abortion plex. Now that's obviously not true, or you think, it's obviously not true, but a member of Congress, uh, that same Congress from earlier, um, he posted this to his Facebook page. He said, this is what we're up against. We gotta stop this, <laughs> right? And I think he did that because he's a fucking idiot, right? <laughs> but also think it was just like, we're in a fast news cycle, click, clack, clock, whatever, who knows? 
and uh, it pre-aligned with his worst fears. He's like, probably. He saw this, probably. I don't know. What's $8 billion? I work for Congress. I don't even know how to count. So there you go. Um, so that was sort of interesting. More interesting was watching the community take this identity and put it somewhere it didn't exactly belong. Yelp. <laughs> Some enterprising fan slash reader slash community member said, you know what? There should be an abortion flex. And they cre you can build a building without building a building. It's uh, like cheaper than Second Life, too. And so um, took all the cues from the story, put it in the appropriate town, and that would have been interesting. What was amazing is that this creation attracted 283 reviews <laughs> of the abortion plex, uh, such average length essays as this one, this four star reviews. I stopped by here to check it out because I got a gift card from my friend <laughs> who told me that the abortion plex has the best mimosas and performs the best abortions. <laughs> and let me tell you, I'm a sucker for both. Uh, and more, just more, 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 more. Now, it's not on Yelp anymore, so this is the history. Uh, maybe it's on Internet Archive uh, in some version. Venmo, which is a bill-paying system, heavily with roommates and colleagues and friends uh, splitting bills is a common feature. There's a little notes field uh, that they default to share publicly. And one of our bloggers, Mike Faley, dug into what's going on with these Venmo payments, and people are putting ridiculous excuses for why they are paying people in this public feed. Uh, going a whole week without peeing the bed. There you go, who's a good little Mikey, um, for purchasing a couple of life-threatening alcoholic beverages that may have set my life on a path to ruin. $20, that's a pretty good deal. Uh, so that was fun. And then there's, you know, from the other side, because I'm biasing this toward people who think as writers and sort of performers and sort of performing in a new medium, but it also comes from the engineering side, and I'm still impressed by uh, this example so we're going to do it live. Uh, again, let's risk it all. Google Voice. They've got a neat little feature which lets you send SMS from your computer. For now, they're merging it into Hangouts, which is a whole other thing, because uh, apparently like, an IM is now a Hangout, and an email is a Google Plus. Like, we're all Google Plus users now because we have Google accounts. Whatever. You're typing your SMS, and watch that character counter go down. right? And then it turns over. You saw that flip over right here. Now we're in message two. There's 150 left. And this is what I do. I used to test software. So I always, when I see an input field, I just want to push it and see what happens. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's amazing. Someone approved that. You know what I'm saying? They committed, and it shipped. And they didn't pull it back. This has been up for years, and it's just... It's a beautiful reminder that there's people making these things. Uh, and there are people who have a sense of humor. And there's judgment in those people. <laughs> I kinda, and, and it, for me, it triggers a response, because I sometimes get those text messages from friends. It's just so long. I said, like, why don't you just email? You know there's a whole other app you could use for this. <laughs> and so I, what this should do is like auto-compose an email message if you keep going. Uh, but that's a, you know, my humble suggestion to the, well, they're shutting it down, so it doesn't matter. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun. So the, the third level is the biggest one. It's the most interesting to me, which is these circles are so overlapped, you're actually co-creating. And there's almost humor in the code and code in the humor. And it's not just a hijacking or misuseful application. Um, it's natively built to create uh, a new world, a universal build, if you will, across these two very different potentially domains. So I mentioned our comedy hack days. And I want to show you. Um, a little bit of what one team did at Comedy Hack Day. Do, do, do. All right, cool. So this is with the, um, one of our co-founders, Craig Cannon. He's the guy that we feed the Red Bull and occasional sunlight. He um, said, what would happen if I took my awkward comedy friends and paired them with my awkward developer friends? And what you get is something really, really beautiful. Here is an uh, example. How you guys doing? Everybody doing good? Thank you so much for having us here. We're so happy to be at Hack Day. Uh, we are Sly Sound. I am West Hazard. This is Trevor Burnham. And we're here to tell you about an app that we feel is going to have everyday usability for almost everybody in this room. Want to talk a little bit about it, Trevor? Sly Sound works just like Shazam, except without the embarrassment of everyone around you knowing that you're using Shazam. When you open it up, it looks just like you're checking your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because, in fact, you are checking your Twitter feed. It's all there. But meanwhile, in the background, silently, it's listening for music. And when it identifies a track, it's going to text you that information. So you'll look like a cool guy who's just checking your Twitter and then getting a bunch of texts <laughs> instead of using Shazam. Basically, we've created Shazam for hipsters. And what better way to do a hipster audio app than using obsolete technology for no other reason than that it looks kind of cool? Here we go. Wow. <laughs> That's an amazing track. Who was that? What? You don't know Anna Tijoux? That's one of her best tracks, 1977. No, I never heard. What's your deal? She's a French Chilean MC. She used to be in Makiza. Come on, man. Oh, wow. Is she, <laughs> is she like big in America now? Well, not especially, but that song was used in an episode of Breaking Bad. Uh, I think it was season four, episode five. Wow! <laughs> Which is how we all talk, obviously. Um, I also love that his definition of a cool guy is just someone who gets lots of texts, just is all the time. That's, that's how you know you're cool. Uh, which in some ways is uh, how we define it. So that's one example. The other, um, which I'll show you, I think I will show you. Yes. So the winning team from that last event, that was at the MIT Media Lab, they built a website which builds websites uh, dynamically. I think it's probably going to take a lot of work from some of the people in this room. Uh, it's a great party game, in fact. You put in uh, a preferably a proper noun, maybe a person of some kind of note, and it will generate a crazy-looking conspiracy website, like the kind your uncle forwards you. It's talking about Building 7 and like the Illuminati, and somebody listened to Alec Jones a bit too much. So I uh, will put in Ruby on Rails. And let's see what the truth about Ruby on Rails is. I have signed document from biologists confirming evolution of third son humanoid in conjunction with Ruby on Rails, Jewish God, Christian God, Muslim God, all sanctioned Ruby on Rails in holy writ. Sex was meant to include Ruby on Rails. <laughs> H stripped away, five return plus six redeemed only by Ruby on Rails. Wake up, Ruby on Rails is a gift and the sheep are keeping it hidden. Now this page just goes and goes and goes. Like there's gifts going on here. Um, and if you refresh it, it's going to generate a whole new website. God is the only true Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails is the only true God. And it sort of tiles these images and does... Uh, really, I think, really uh, sort of handcrafted uh, web art uh, that we're looking at here. So that was a lot of fun. You should put your friends through <laughs> the, the uh, truthforhumanity.com generator. And the, uh, the last thing that I'll, I'll share with you, um, Magic Story Maker is the second to last thing. If you have kids, uh, you know how annoying they can be um, and how useless. Uh, the combination, that Venn diagram is very painful. Uh, for economic growth, at least. And so when kids want you to read to them, they often pick the same book over and over. And it gets very frustrating um, because you're getting dumber every time. <laughs> what these developers and comedians built was Magic Story Maker. It lets you choose a news story that you like and then apply a themed children's uh, design theme on top of that so the real news looks like a children's book. And you can actually know what's going on in the grown-up world, and your kid can see a monkey sliding up and down a tree, and everybody wins. The, uh, the most recent thing, I just actually came in from MIT on this trip, is looking at Google Glass um, and performance. Google Glass and improv comedy. Google Glass is a very creepy thing in some ways. It's very interesting in others. It's very expensive, no matter how you look at it. Um, and so working with two teams there, an improv team in Boston and these developers who've created something called WearScript that lets anybody build on Glass as a platform, we came up with a show concept. Let's do improv comedy right here in Chicago is a, a huge font of all that. And let's have the players wearing Glass. And let's think about the interaction with the audience differently. There's often games in improv where players will pick a word out of a hat that's been submitted. This takes the friction out of that, and they just get it on their display. We also said, let the audience see what the players know, but not have the players see what each other sees. So what you're seeing on this grid here are the heads up of everybody's uh, different screens. There were six players at various times. So I'm actually going to skip that example due to time. But the more interesting one, let's play this.
present their product, present their pitch, and we're going to decide which one we want to fund. Our next pitch, please. Folks, I have spent the last 18 months and several hundred thousand dollars That's developing a product that I know you're going to love. Now, how many times a day do you have ideas that you need to write down? Multiply that by how many times a day you need to get something to eat. Wouldn't it be convenient if the surface on which you wrote things down, i.e. paper, were also something that you could fold into a delicious sandwich? <laughs> I've been studying it in Tokyo, and I've formed what I call the origami sandwich, a foldable sandwich in the shape of a goose that you can use to not only eat, but enjoy its beauty in all of its forms. Thank you very much. This is hers. Next pitch, please. Fear, passion, headaches. <laughs> right? So it's, it's got this PowerPoint karaoke feel, but the real timeness of it just changes the speed and dynamic of the creativity. This last one, and this truly is the last, so they are, there's a game called Jump Genre, and you're kind of, in the real world, a director might call out, switch the genre, but because of the speed of audience input, it happens mid-motion. This is the last clip, and then I will uh, uh, try to respect your time. The next thing we're going to do is called Jump Genre, and I'm going to have uh, Will and Christine begin a scene that is going to take place in a location, which we'll see in just a second here. And uh, there we go, look at that. And uh, periodically throughout the scene, they're gonna get some styles or genre on their glass that they are going to use to shift where they are and what they're doing. Do you hear that? No. <laughs> but I feel it. You feel that? Yeah. <gasps> Behind the clothes, it's a clue and a monster. <laughs> ah! Ah! No, save me! No, I'm sorry. I can only save one of us, and I'm gonna have to save myself. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Yes, no, please. I made that monster. Uh, now I. The way. Now I am that monster. <laughs> the way you hold that knife is so romantic. I'm gonna make love to you, and then I'm gonna murder you. <laughs> right? Uh, so look, yeah, clap for them, clap for them. I, didn't, I wasn't on stage there. I talked to uh, the people behind the engineering on the glass side. Like, they have a custom server. You can remote control six heads up at the same time. And what we're trying to look at now is, like, who changes more? Like sometimes th these performers are not used to the abruptness of that interruption, obviously. The technology's never been used this way, and so they're both editing each other. Uh, and we're gonna be creating new types of apps. They, I'm gonna advise from a great distance through smart emails. And uh, the performers are gonna have to adjust in some other interesting way, but that's the super overlap that I hope for. And as you guys do the things you do, you're building a whole new world for us. I just love you to keep the fun, the creative, the collaborative, in mind, push from where you're going already, and think about this escalating level uh, of creation. It's the future, it's awesome, and thank you for having me. Enjoy your conference. Rails for life! <laughs>